and we have the Palette Lecture next. Uh, the Palette Lecture is supported by Cydus of uh, Sunshine Healthcare. And uh, today's speaker is Dr. Chaturi Jayavadana, MBBS, MD Medicine. She's a consultant in endocrinology at Teaching Hospital, Kegol. She obtained her MBBS from Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo in 2009, and received her MD from Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo in 2013. Dr. Jayavadana completed her overseas training at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital in Brisbane, Australia. She also has many publications under her name. So today she's going to talk to us on thyroid stories, a case-based approach. It's over to you, Chandra. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll go through some thyroid stories. Uh, before going to the case studies, uh, just a little bit of thyroid physiology. As we all know, this is the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. The hypothalamus secretes TRH, the thyrotropin releasing hormone, which acts on anterior pituitary to secrete TSH. Pituitary TSH stimulates thyroid to secrete T4 and T3, the thyroid hormones. And this TSH secretion is, in turn, is controlled through the negative feedback mechanism of thyroid hormones. And uh, thyroid is the sole source of T4. However, only 20% of T3 is coming from the thyroid. Rest of the T3 is from the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So in practical situations, day-to-day -day clinical life, we can measure TSH and serum-free T4 and T3. These are the most important tests. We can measure total T3 and T4, but rarely using day-to-day -day practice nowadays. We'll go to the first case. She's a 38-year-old female who was previously healthy and presented with tiredness and constipation. So the GP has done the TSH levels and it is 35 with a low free T4. So the case is straightforward. We look into the thyroid axis. The thyroid gland, due to variety of abnormalities, causes insufficient secretion of T4 and T3. Therefore, the body thinks, I should stimulate the thyroid more and more. Therefore, the TSH increase. So the problem is in the primary gland, we call this primary hypothyroidism. The commonest cause is autoimmune thyroid disease. However, we also call this, the, I'll discuss the later, the subclinical uh, hypothyroidism. However, once the TSH is more than 10, we used to call it overt hypothyroidism as well. As we all know, the diagnosis of hypothyroidism, we have to rely on the laboratory test because there are no specificity or specificity of the typical clinical manifestations. There are a lot of clinical manifestations. However, we cannot attribute it is solely to the thyroid gland and they are big. There are no pathognomonic features. So we have to rely on the laboratory test when you are diagnosing a patient with primary hypothyroidism. So once you have diagnosed it, you have to start the replacement. And dose always depends on the severity of hypothyroidism. But usually it is the full replacement dose is 1.6 micrograms per kg per day. So in a patient with 70 kilograms adult, it comes to around 112. So we can straight away start 100 micrograms per day in a patient young, other young and otherwise healthy. However, when it goes to old age and patients with ischemic heart disease, we tend to start a lower dose and then titrate gradually over some period of time, like we can increase the thyroxine dose every two weeks. 
The clinical benefit usually starts after about three to five days. However, normalization of TSH will take several months as it will take time to adjust the hypothalamo pituitary axis. So the thyroxine should be taken empty stomach. So the preferable time is the early in the morning because most of the people sleep in the night and uh, four hours uh, without any meal once they get up. And it is always advisable to take the tablet and to be without anything, without any meal or a tea for about 30 to 45 minutes for the maximum absorption. And it's a practical point. Once you have started uh, the patient on a particular brand, just continue the same brand because when you alter the brands, there are some differences in their bioavailability. So there is an alteration of TSH. So if you have to uh, change the brand for different circumstances, just, make, just measure the TSH after about six weeks to make sure that your uh, patient is optimally given thyroxine. So it's better to continue the same brand of thyroxine. So let's say after about six weeks, the patient brings a report like this. So the TSH and T4. The TSH is still elevated, it is 15 and the free T4 is still low. What are you going to do at this point? So you have to ask about the compliance, you have to ask about the storage, you have to ask about whether they have changed the brand of thyroxine. After asking all these questions, this means they are not, your dose is not adequate. So you can increase the thyroxine dose after looking this test after about six weeks. So after about six weeks, Patient brings a report like this. What are you going to do at this point? The TSH is still elevated. Is it 15? And the free T4 is elevated to. It is 1.78. What does this mean? Yes, okay. You have to ask about everything. And this usually represents the poor compliance. The patient has not been taking thyroxine for some time. And all of a sudden taking thyroxine and especially if the patient took the thyroxine in the morning usually the free t4 goes up so to avoid these controversies in a patient with primary hypothyroidism you can only monitor the patient with tsh no need of free t4 tsh is enough so the i mean you have to confirm the diagnosis the primary hypothyroidism so after confirming the diagnosis of primary hypothyroidism, you can monitor the patient only with TSH. Free T4 is not needed. So you can adjust your thyroxine dose according to the TSH. Let's move on to the second case. This is again a female, 43-year-old, who has no comorbidities and found to have weight loss and palpitations for three months duration. And on examination, she has bilateral proptosis as well. So the GP has done the thyroid function test. The TSH is suppressed with high free T4 and free T3 levels. So again, if we going back to the axis, the thyroid gland is producing more and more thyroxine. Therefore, the body thinks I should reduce the stimulation, so the TSH is low. We use these words interchangeably, thyrotoxicosis and hyperthyroidism, but the nomenclature is thyrotoxicosis means the clinical, physiological and biochemical findings due to tissues exposed to excess thyroid hormones. And the hyperthyroidism means the gland is producing more and more thyroxine. So you can have thyrotoxicosis without hyperthyroidism. So the gland is not producing much thyroxine, but the gland is separating the preformed thyroxine, like in thyroiditis, but the patient is thyrotoxic, but the gland is silent. 
And so these are the differential diagnosis, the common differential diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. That means the gland is producing more and more thyroxine in Graves' disease and thyroid nodules. Uh, maybe multinodular multi goiter or maybe solitary nodules. The TSHO mass and pituitary hormone resistance are extremely rare. And the patient is thyrotoxic, but there is no hyperthyroidism in thyroid inflammation, especially the most common causes are postpartum thyroiditis and subacute thyroiditis. Other causes are extremely rare. So the clinical manifestations of hypo, hyperthyroidism are largely independent of the cause. They have increased cardiac output caused by both increased peripheral oxygen needs and cardiac contractility. And there are a lot of signs and symptoms, maybe due to the sympathetic overactivation as well. So if, they, if your patient is having, if your thyrotoxic patient is having one of these uh, clinical fe features, thyroid ophthalmopathy, thyroid dermopathy, or thyroid acropathy, those are pathognomonic features of Graves' disease. So if your patient is thyrotoxic and if you have either these clinical features, you can straight away call the patient is having Graves' disease. So in Graves' disease, the main autoantigen is thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor. So the antibody is TSH receptor antibody. We call it TRAP antibody in day-to-day -day clinical practice and extremely useful in some instances. Not available in government sector, but it is available in private sector, sometimes very useful. And this autoantibody is also pathognomonic. If we say the other thyroid antibodies, like uh, thyroid peroxidase antibody or antithyroglobulin antibody, they can be present in normal individuals as well. However, the TSH receptor antibody or the TRAB antibody is only present in patients with Graves' disease. So, in some instances, very useful test. To differentiate the different causes, we can use radioactive iodine scan. So, you can differentiate Graves' disease from toxic multinodular goiter or in solitary toxic adenoma. So once you have diagnosed the patient with hyperthyroidism, you have to rapidly ameliorate the symptoms of sympathetic overactivation by beta blockers. And beta blockers should be started in most patients as soon as the diagnosis is made if there are no other contraindications to beta blockers. And the decreasing of thyroid hormone production antithyroid drugs, and we have other options as well. So we have three options, antithyroid drugs, radioactive iodine, and thyroidectomy. All three options are effective, but all three options have significant side effects and their consequences as well. And there are no consensus as to the best treatment, and we can use more than one treatment method as well. So the treatment mode depends on the age of the patient, the other comorbidities, severity of the disease, the goiter size, and the presence or absence of ophthalmopathy and the patient preference as well. So in patients with moderate to severe or sight-threatening ophthalmopathy, we can't give radioactive iodine because it can worsen the radioactive, it can worsen the ophthalmopathy as well. So in our clinical setting, we usually start the patient is on antithyroid drugs as the first line therapy and then decide on the definitive therapy, the way after observing the way the patient behaves. So we do have two antithyroid drugs, carbimazole or methimazole. Methimazole is not available in Sri Lanka. So we have carbimazole and propyl thyuracil. So what are you going to do? So what are you going to start? Actually, we have only one choice because it is carbimazole. 
PTU is restricted for three main indications. So in generally, we can't start with PTU as a first line therapy. So it should be carbimazole. Carbimazole is a very effective drug, not available, I think not available for the government sector for a long time now. Rapidly achieves you thyroidism, and we can use one stall in regime, so it has better compliance and less toxicity. So when we talk about propyl thyrosine, it, it can cause hepatotoxicity. The onset is abrupt and it has a very fulminant cause and the patient ended up with usually if the patient develops hepatotoxicity, the patient usually ends up with fulminant hepatic failure need transplantation. Yes, we have given P2, and this side effect is extremely rare. However, FD has not approved to use it um, in common day-to-day -day practice. So we have to go for carbimazole unless the patient is in first trimester of pregnancy or the patient is having thyroid storm. In thyroid storm, it is very important because it reduces the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Therefore, it can be used in, it should be used in thyroid storm. And when there are minor reactions to carbimazole, you can use PTU. However, yes, I go. So these are the usual side effects, the usual minor side effects, fever, itching, rash, arthralgia, nausea, and some abnormal sensation. So these minor side effects, you can give some antihistamines and paracetamol and you can continue the carbimazole without stopping the drug because the carbimazole is the only available drug. However, if the patient develops a granulocytosis, it is rare. It only occurs in 0.1% or 0.5%. And it is idiosyncratic. That means it can occur at any point of the treatment. So the routine full blood count is not usually recommended. And it is usually recommended with the febrile illness, usually if there is pharyngitis as well. So in a patient developing a granulocytosis or other serious side effects while taking the other drug, you cannot start the other drug. That means if the patient develops a granulocytosis with carbimazole, you cannot start the patient on PTU because there is a cross reactivity between these two medications. So both options are out. So you have to sort some other method to control the thyrotoxicosis till they get the definite treatment. So the approximate starting dose of antithyroid drugs based on initial free T4 values, you can start the patient based on TSH. However, when the patient is very toxic and if you only have the TSH, you can start the carbimazole. However, the accurate dose always depends on the how much the free T4 is elevated. Or in T3 toxicosis, you have to look at the T3. So if it is the upper limit, if it is more than 1.1 to 1.5, you can start carbimazole 10 to 50 milligrams. But if it is more than thrice, you have to go for higher doses. Therefore, always do the free T4 at the initial period of drug, initial period when you are starting carbimazole. So we'll go back to our case. So you have started, she has bilateral proptosis and some ophthalmopedia. So the diagnosis is Graves' disease. So you have to start on carbimazole and you have started on carbimazole and the patient brings a report after about six weeks. So the TSH is still suppressed. It is 0 0.01 with elevated free T4 levels. So what are you going to do at this point? Yes, you have to ask about the compliance, especially these days, patients are not taking the uh, adequate dose, the given dose, because they have to buy it from outside. So yes, you have to ask about the compliance. You have to ask, uh, <clears throat> and after asking the compliance, this usually implies your dose is not enough, or patient sometimes may take more than six weeks to get their free T4 normalized. So you can increase your carbimazole dose at this point 
because the free T4 is still elevated. Let's say your patient brings a report like this. These reports are not uncommon. So the TSH is still suppressed with a free T4 of 0 0.75. Free T4 is low. So what are you going to do at this point? Free T4 is low. That means your patient has responded very well. So are you going to reduce your carbimazole dose at this point? Or the TSH is not suppressed, still suppressed. It has not normalized. So are you going to increase your carbimazole dose at this point? What are you going to do? This is tricky. So the free T4. So when you're managing a patient with hyperthyroidism, even at the initial phase, go by free T4. So in this particular case, the free T4 is low. So you have to reduce the carbimazole dose and don't try to normalize TSH because the hypothalamic pituitary axis will take some time to normalize TSH, give some time to the axis and you focus on the T4 and you reduce the carbimazole dose. So don't, so in a patient with hyperthyroidism, monitoring with TSH is not enough. You have to always do the free T4 or in T3 toxicosis, you have to do T3. So this is a very important because I have seen a lot of uh, doctors increase the carbimazole dose to normalize the TSH. At least in the initial period, the TSH will be suppressed for about longer duration of time, maybe months. So let the axis recover slowly. You focus on free T4 and reduce the carbimazole dose. I think it is clear. So we'll go on to the next case. This is the case number three. Again, a female, 38-year-old, asymptomatic, with no comorbidities and found to have TSH level of 6.9 in a routine medical checkup. And her free T4 is normal. So these reports are very common these days. And we call this subclinical hypothyroidism. And what does the subclinical mean? Subclinical is denoting a disease which is not severe enough to present with definite or readily observable symptoms according to the Oxford Dictionary. However, in our hypothyroidism also, we do not have any readily observable symptoms and the symptoms are very vague. So now the problem is we are whether we are going to treat this patient or not to treat this patient. So there are treatment algorithms available. So you always the subclinical hypothyroidism or subclinical hyperthyroidism, which I'm going to discuss later, their free T4 is normal. So there is no hurry to go, go and treat. So you can always take time so you repeat the thyroid functions with 10 TTPO antibodies if freely available. If it is normalized, because certain number of people get normalized TSH and free T4 after some time. So you can repeat it after about one year. But if it is persistently elevated, this is again the algorithm. So if the TSH is more than 10, although the free T4 is normal, we tend to treat these patients with thyroxine. Now the problem is the patients who are having TSH less than 10. So the algorithm divide them into two main groups, close to 10 and close to the reference range. So if it is close to the reference range and if the patient is not planning to have a baby or no other symptoms, you can always wait and without giving any thyroxine and all you can always repeat, this, repeat uh, the TSH after about six months. But if the patient is not of symptoms and the, I think the most common symptoms they are telling is hair loss and they expect some treatment from us. So if it is closer to 10, you can always give a course of thyroxine and see 
whether the patient improves the symptoms or else you can monitor the patient. And once the TSH is more than 10, because this is called subclinical hypothyroidism, and certain number of patients will develop over hypothyroidism in due course, so you can follow up the patient. So if the patient is planning a pregnancy or if the patient is pregnant, we have to treat the according to the trimester targets. We do not wait till the TSH is more than 10 in patients who are trying to conceive or the patient the, or in pregnant mothers. So the next case, the case number four, it is a 67-year-old female who presented with palpitations for about three months and found to have atrial fibrillation. The heart rate is 120 beats per minute and she has a multinodular goiter. So the echo shows no valvular disease or OLV dysfunctions. So the TSH is 0.1, that means suppressed and free T4 and free T3 is in normal range. So this is called subclinical hyperthyroidism because the TSH is suppressed. However, the free T4 and free T3 is low. So this again, are you going to treat this patient or not? That is the problem. Since this is again the algorithm, so you can always repeat these tests because sometimes these glucocorticoids and some drugs can reduce the, suppress the TSH. So you can always check these uh, in two to three months. So if it get normalization, so no treatment is needed. And if the TSH is persistently low, this is, this is the algorithm. So as a rule of thumb, you need to treat patient with hyperthyroidism if the patient is if the patient is more older. When it comes to subclinical hypothyroidism, you tend to treat the younger patients because the consequences are higher. But if when it comes to subclinical hyperthyroidism, you tend to treat the older patients. So you then the guidelines uh, categorize into two main categories. So the TSH is well suppressed, less than 0.1. If the patient's age is more than 65, you can treat the patient. Or if the patient is having heart disease, especially atrial fibrillation and some arrhythmias, or if the patient is having osteoporosis, we have to treat the patient. So the TSH is in between 0 0.1 to 0.5. If the patient is less than 65, you can wait. Or if it is if she's having heart disease, so the main determine. Uh, factors are the heart disease and the osteoporosis. So if those are there, you have to treat the subclinical hyperthyroidism. So you do not start very high doses of carbimazole. Usually carbimazole 5 milligram or even usually 5 milligram is enough because what happens? Because their T4 is normal, if we eat very large amount of uh, so then pre T4 will be very low. So you have to uh, think about this. So you do not start very high doses of carbimazole, just five milligram will be enough. And especially if the patient is having nodular goiter, this will not wean off. And if she's not happy for the surgery, so you have to consider treatment. And the main uh, determined factors are heart disease and osteoporosis. So when it comes to subclinical diseases, so the biochemical investigation leading to a lab diagnosis with some clinical consequences. And once the report is available, we do not know what to do. So do not treat the first lab report. So you can always has time, you may have time. So you always repeat it. And the treatment decision depends on the age, symptomatic nature, TSH, anti-TPO antibody, CV disease, and osteoporosis. As I mentioned earlier, the subclinical hypothyroidism, the consequences are more in younger. So you treat the patient with thyroxine, younger patients, especially if they are planning for a pregnancy. 
and subclinical hyper. The consequences are more in elderly patients, so you treat the elderly patient if there are indications. And if it is pregnancy, you have to go for the trimester targets, uh, which are available. So I think we have completed uh, the hyper and hypothyroidism, both overt and subclinical. So we'll move on to the next case. This is the case number five. She is 45 year old female who presented with neck pain and tenderness for about two weeks. So these are typical cases in clinical settings. You do not get uh, the straightforward cases like this, but take the basics, then you can work out. The TSH level is less than 0 0.01. Pre-T4 is high. Fifteen minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. Uh, so the ESR is one hundred and twenty. I just asked that there are forty-five minutes. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the this the ESR is one hundred and twenty. Uh, so this the, this is the. Itis, that means the inflammation of the thyroid gland. So you have uh, thyroiditis with thyroid pain and tenderness and the thyroiditis without thyroid pain and tenderness. Uh, so the thyroiditis with thyroid pain and tenderness, the usual diagnosis is subacute thyroiditis. You have other causes are as well, but the most common cause is subacute thyroiditis. It has a lot of uh, names, dequence thyroiditis, subacute non-suppurative thyroiditis, and it is usually after a viral infection. So the pain is the most common presenting feature, and if the pain is absent, just think about some other, other differential diagnosis. In subacute thyroiditis, there are thyroiditis without pain as well. So it usually follows this triphasic uh, pattern once the patient is thyrotoxic and then the patient is euthyroid and then the, ultimately the patient is hypothyroidic. And this hypothyroid is also for some time. That means it been off some time. Therefore, you have to always monitor the thyroid function test. So, as I mentioned earlier, the gland is not functioning. So, the gland is silent and there are preformed thyroid hormones released. So, it no need of thylamides. That means you do not need carbimazole or profile tyrosine in patients with thyroiditis. You can give some beta blockers and you can manage hypothyroidism with some thyroxine and most of the time it is also transient. So just take the thyroid function test as well, if, even if you started on thyroxine. I'll skip this case. This is the postpartum thyroiditis. I think it is painless and it also has the uh, typical pattern of thyrotoxic phase, euthyroid and hypothyroid. The problem comes when it is when the patient present in postpartum period, whether to whether to differ, how to differentiate it with Graves' disease. So in Graves' disease, usually you get it uh, within the three months of postpartum. So it would be a flare up, first flare up of the Graves' disease, but it usually happens during three months postpartum. But in postpartum thyroiditis, usually it is six months, but it is, it is not a very definite criteria, but you can think. And in Graves' disease, the hyperthyroidism more severe, and in postpartum thyroiditis, it is thyrotoxicosis could be mild. And uh, the most important parameter is if you can do a TSH receptor antibody, that is positive in Graves' disease, and that is negative in postpartum thyroiditis. So you can correctly differentiate between the two. 
So this is an interesting case I want to share with you. She's, um, this is the last case. So she is 16 year old female who was uh, pres who presented to the uh, GP with palpitations and faintishness. So she's in year 10 in the school. So the GP has done TSH and free T4. The TSH is less than 0 0.01. And if you can appreciate the thyroid function test here, the TSH is well suppressed, but the free T4 is only touching the upper limit of the normal. So when I ask, this is a real case. So when I ask the patient about any other symptoms, she is thin built. She uh, denies any rapid recent weight loss. And uh, after some time she came up with, she had nausea and vomiting for the last one month. And this was referred to me by a GP after doing the thyroid function test. And he has started on carbimazole 10 milligrams mani as well. Uh, so I asked about the period of amenorrhea. And she tells she had a period of amenorrhea. However, the periods she has all his period has been always irregular, not uncommon for a girl in 16 years of age. However, I was suspicious and did the urine HCG and it was positive. So this thyroid function is with the gestational thyroid toxicosis and a tragic story on the 16 year old schooling. However, this thyroid functions is due to the gestational thyroid toxicosis. The TSH is well suppressed due to the HCG effect and free T4 is only touching the upper limit of the normal. So these are common. This is called gestational transient thyroid toxicosis and in pregnancy. So you do not need to treat it with carbimazole or antithyroid drugs. It usually weans off. And again, if once you get a referral, so how do you differentiate it from the Graves disease and the gestational transient thyroid toxicosis? So you may be having, if you have a goiter and if you have uh, other features of Graves disease like ophthalmopathy, it is straightforward. So you can start the drugs. However, it usually associated with hyperemesis and the patient was perfectly well before the pregnancy and the symptoms are very mild, but the patient can has the symptoms of pregnancy like palpitations and faintishness. So the TSH is usually suppressed with marginally elevated free T4 levels. So if there are twins, yes, the symptoms are more. And again, in this case, we usually do not do, but uh, it is not necessary as well. But if the, if the case is extreme, you can do a TSH receptor antibody to differentiate. However, in day-to-day -day clinical practice, we do not do that. So we can treat the patient. This gestational transient thyroid toxicosis doesn't uh, need any antithyroid drugs because it is the effect of HCG. If the patient is having very mild, uh, if the patient is having palpitations and other sympathetic overactivity, you can give a short course of beta blockers, carbidilol or propanadol, and then it is to monitor the thyroid function test as well. So I'll wind off that. And thank you very much for listening and welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Marie. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Big questions? Okay, I think it's time that we'll wind up the session. Thank you very much for your presentation as well as everybody who has participated. So that will close the sessions today. And Chatri, please accept our uh, certificate of appreciation.